and it is out of the way, so we may continue now. It, does that give you a little better understanding? I've always led the charge. I've always given an example. Uh, I've never asked anyone to do anything that I would not do at our conferences. I have never eaten a bite of food until everybody there was fed. I believe if you're going to be a leader and you're going to ask somebody else to do something, you must be prepared to do it twice before they. I agree with you. And, uh, yeah, what you said is, is helping me to understand. It, it's, it's a lot of information. And, and like I tried to say earlier, sometimes I only get it in bits and pieces. Oh, I understand. And it's hard to put it all together, but I'm, I'm headed in that direction. So. Yeah, and forgive me if sometimes I'm not as patient as as you might wish me to be. I've been at this for many, many years, and sometimes I find it absolutely frustrating when people cannot grasp what I know so well. <laughs> well you've only read 10,000 books, but I haven't. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I know, and I, I become very impatient uh, because I, I want so much for people uh, to, to understand and, and come out of that, of that enslavement and that, that mental vacuum that they live their lives in for most of their lives. And I, and I know exactly how that is because I lived most of my life that way before I began to, uh, quote, see the light, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Bill. I've enjoyed talking to you. You're welcome. Thank you for calling. 520-333-4578 is the number. Where are you, Mike Mistrada? You keep telling me you're going to call. I haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> I bet he sat up in his chair when he heard that. Good evening. You're on the air. Bill, I've got a note stuck in my forehead. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, rabbit stew. Yeah. No, that's not it. Okay. He said all, you know, well, <laughs> although, although we did find a rabbit today in the yard that apparently a coyote had dismembered during the night and uh, uh, found two little girls asking us a lot of questions about those ears and stuff scattered mm -hmm. all over the yard. That uh -oh. was that was a little uh, little tough. Bill, uh, I think it all goes back to Scripture, what Jesus said in the parable of the sower, where the wayside hearer cannot, get, he cannot understand the things of God. So anything else, like you say, this really explained it for me, that these men, most of them, don't believe in anything. At the highest levels. The ones in between the highest levels and the lowest levels, they do. They believe all this nonsense that they're filling their heads with. Oh, I see. Okay. You see? In other words, there, there, are, there is a certain amount of them that do believe in this. To get into the lodge, you have to profess a belief in a supreme being. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you what that supreme being is, okay. nor do they ask you what you think it is. And ultimately, they, they say that supreme being is Lucifer. Well, during all of those years of the ceremony and the symbology and the teachings and the speeches and reading the books and the teachings of the Lodge, then they take the minds of these people and twist them around to believe what they want them to believe. See, they have them for a lot of years to play with their heads. Okay. Well, it's very interesting. Uh... See, at the highest level, see, all of these people who join the lodges, all of these various lodges, they spend all these years looking for the secret that they've been promised. That they will be one of the elect. And that they're going to learn great secrets as a member of the lodge. If, if they ever get to the highest levels of the lodge, the only secret that they learn that there is, is how to use the promise of a secret to lead and manipulate all of the members below them. Find out this uh, the, uh, the symbols they use, the hand signals. <laughs> I mean, how do you find this out? Do you go to the library, or I mean, no, you're looking you're looking for a silver bullet. I told you a hundred years. There's not one. It requires work, study, reading hundreds of books, sitting down and piecing together the puzzle. Because I, I've seen these, I've seen them use these signals. You know, in my like I work in the building trade. You know, and you, you see them and. You, I mean, I don't understand a lot of it. The quickest way is to join the lodge. But if you do that, you have to take oaths yeah. that, uh, that uh, as far as I'm concerned, strips you of your soul. Right. I, I would not do that. No. No. <laughs> and I, I don't ever believe for a moment that those oaths don't mean anything. Grown men don't make oaths that don't mean anything if those grown men have any honor whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm sure they 
sure they need something because it, uh, apparently it's, it's holding these people into, into the... Well, I guarantee you. It means exactly what they say. Yeah, right. Right. It means something to them. Something and if their oath in the lodge doesn't mean anything, what does their oath in a court of law mean? You see, they're liars. And when you ask them what they believe in and what it all means, and they stand there and lie to you for about two hours and tell you it doesn't mean anything, they're under oath. They cannot ever tell you the secrets of the lodge. They must lie to you, and they do. And the books in the lodge tell them to lie. And I'll read the oaths to you. It says that they have to protect and shelter a brother, even if he's committed murder and treason. Right? No. Murder and treason not accepted. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. Oh, no. Uh -huh. See, that's how they get away with what they get away with. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, you know, I, I heard someone uh, recently teaching about the uh, the Knights of Columbus <coughs> and, uh, and their oath, you know. And now, I don't know if, uh, if this was... You probably know more about this than, than, than this man did, but he says that... Uh, you know, they put that that fourth degree thing where they get the sword. You know, that uh, they they put it to like a, a woman's body and kill the baby, you know, for the Pope or whatever, you know. I mean, does that, does that sound familiar to you? Unless it, it, I have the oath and can read it on the air, I'm not going to say anything because anything I say could be misconstrued. Yes, I am familiar with it, but I'm not going to comment on it. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Unless I can read the oath verbatim. Okay. Okay. And the ceremony, so the people understand. You think you might want to do that sometime? I don't know. I've done a lot of it on past episodes. Mm -hmm. I read what I think is necessary for people to, to know. All secret societies are subversive. I don't care what you call them. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what religion they pretend to belong to, or what religion uh, uh, condones their lodge, or or, or whether they uh, are condoned by a religion or not. It doesn't make any difference to me. All secret societies, I have studied them all. They're all subversive. I don't care what their name is. Period. Well, if they weren't subversive, they wouldn't be secret. I've learned that. There is no need for secrecy when people are not doing anything that requires secrecy. There is no need for secrecy if people are not doing something that they know the community would not approve of. Exactly. It's like you turn the light on, all the rats take off. Hey, Bill, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Talk to you later. 520-333-4578 is the number. <laughs> the number. The number. The, uh, by the way, the little uh, lesson that I gave you at the beginning of the broadcast tonight was taken from The Lost Light by Alvin Boyd Kuhn. It was taken from the writings of Manly P. Hall. Albert Pike was taken from my own research, quite a bit of which was interjected in the, the, uh, the uh, what would you call it? The teaching? The, teaching. the lecture? The lecture. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. And, uh, gee, how did we get all the way around there? That's, uh, <laughs> that's a numero tres, huh? Oh. Well, we'll just get over here and see what we can do with it. And, uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay, folks. A little thinking music. Hour of the time, I'm William Cooper. Whenever I do uh, lectures or teachings on the mysteries, I like to play this uh, sort of esoteric sounding music to uh, give you some room for some mental machination, if you so choose. 520 333 4578 
इस दुनिया में saying there are, there are messages there and there are pagan messages from the Celt religion. That's what I was telling my wife. And I mean that's one of her favorite little groups there. It doesn't mean they're bad messages. Some of them are really good messages. Okay. You know, all peoples and all religions, it doesn't matter what they believe in, teach good things. They just don't always teach what other religions and other peoples consider to be good things. And some of them, uh, uh, from time to time, teach bad things, including Christianity. When they taught that it was good to burn at the stake people who did not believe what other Christians believed or what the Catholic Church dictated should be believed. I totally agree, sir. But I, personally, I like the music, the melody, whether you listen to the words or not. Oh, I do too. I think it's some of the most beautiful music ever written. Okay, sir. And not only that... That's, why I, that's one of the reasons I use it. Okay. I try to use music that not only carries a message with it, but is aesthetically pleasing to not only me, but the listening audience. And I also use a lot of music that I know my audience has never heard in their life in order to sort of expand their their feeling for music. Well, personally, I've heard at least 80% of the music you played. And well, good. Some of the older stuff, um, I'm getting up for that, but... <laughs> Enya, yes, and even the Rose by Seal, yep, I remember mm-hmm. that back when WCR used to wear that. Yep. I was also wanting to tell you, I'm calling from Texas here, uh-huh. I was, and we got the Preparedness Expo. Yeah. And Bo Grice, I thought he shot himself, he's on the list, he's supposed to show up. He does something. <laughs> oh, me. Maybe I need to. No, I can't say that. He, he must have been. He must not have been too upset. <laughs> I'm not sure what a 45 should do, but I didn't say that. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. No, no, we don't. We don't, even, we, don't, we don't even want to joke about things like that. I don't know. Not on air. I'm sorry. No, not anywhere. We don't want to joke about things like that. Uh, I wish him well. I wish he would figure out what he wants to do in life. And well, I know. I, I know what he wants to do in life. He wants to enslave the rest of us. Oh. <laughs> Okay, sir. Well, I appreciate it. My wife was interested because it's been in you every song, and that's her favorite band. And I said, Daddy, grab all our cassettes. There's no words there in English. Because I could read the words, and knowing what I know, knowing what she knows, hmm. You know, I, I knew there was something there. There's a reason for that, but the music is awesome. I mean, it's laid back. It's good work. But, yep, I guarantee you. If anybody can understand a word she says, because it's so much reverb and everything else, and speaks and whatever. Well, you you can if you're listening to it in your home on on your own CD or tape player. You're listening to it over shortwave. I mean, you're lucky to understand what I say half the time. Well, that's that's true. But at the same time, we have all our cassettes, but they don't put her words in there. You know, 
know, like a lot of bands actually put their... Oh, well, you need to sit down and concentrate. I don't have any trouble okay. hearing what she says. And you also have to understand that on, on a lot of these, the music that she does, she's not singing it in English. She's singing it in Old English or Celtic. Celtic, yes. yes. That's what I was saying. I'm, I'm telling Daddy that you watch. It'll blow your mind. If you really know what she's saying, you might have a different perspective, but... The music she loves, and I like it too, you know, but um, that's just music. I don't think there's nothing evil with music, per se, but... Depends on the intent of the person who wrote it, and what it says, and who it's aimed at. Exactly. But you have a right there's to... There's a modus operandi there. Yeah. You're, you're correct. I just want to double-check that, because I've never understood a word she ever said, so... But I like her laid-back music, so... I will relate that to my wife of 15 years, very happily married. And you are a blessing there, and Dole. Hey. I wish you the best, and you're a good apprentice. Pay attention to this man. Cooper <laughs> has woken me up in what I thought was freedom. And I thought I was ahead of time, and all of a sudden I hear this one. So, I want to congratulate you people and continue on. I'll support you all I can. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Have a good night. Thank see you for you. calling. 520-333-4578. That's, uh, let me see, where am I at here? Good evening, you're on the air. Hi, this is Steve from Fort Myers, Florida. I just wanted to call to say thank you for risking so much uh, to give the truth to the American people and the world. Thank you. Thanks. All right, bye. That's it? <laughs> thank you. 520-333-4578. Thank you very much, and thank you for calling. Um, hmm. well, don't put me on a pedestal, folks. I'm human just like you, and believe me, I'll be the first one to fall off. I've always told you that. I don't want to be what you, what I'm trying to get you away from. I don't want to be the person that you blindly follow. Never wanted that. Don't want it. Don't ever, don't do it, okay? <laughs> Good evening, you're on the air. Hello? Mr. Cooper. Yes, sir. I've been pushing the replay over and over. I'm sorry. I'm happy I got back on. I was going to ask you a question also. Got back uh, on? When were you on before? I was just on right before the last caller. Oh. The one that's on my Enya. Uh-huh. I got the Texas draw. So what can I do for you? Okay, sir. I was going to ask you about uh, FM broadcasting. Yeah. One small question about, I understand that you guys turn your 101.1 off. Yes. Advertise? Yes. Okay. Well, what would I do if I rebroadcast a show of yours or anybody else's? You what gotta, you gotta, why are you asking me? It would be your station. You do whatever you want to do. Okay, I just thought it was something legal. It, 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 I'm not putting it on the spot. 101.1 FM Eager is not owned by me. It's owned by a charitable trust. Okay, okay. That belongs to my daughter's. It is a non-profit foundation. Therefore, there can be no commercials on 101.1 FM Eager. It's a community service, non-profit station. Okay, sir. Well. But what you do with your station is your business, not mine. All right. Well, I'm just asking advice. So, I really need to have a trust there. But I don't have the funds to do that, I understand. But... I was just wondering, because if you, I rebroadcast a certain station... You don't have to have a trust. Well, I followed your rules as far as rebroadcasting yours. Mm -hmm. Everything, Swiss America, everything's off there. So Swiss America? We haven't done anything with Swiss America in a long way. Okay, I've got some old okay, tanks, sir. Oh, I see. Okay. You're just talking about the rules off the Internet. Just now, yes. Yeah. I'm just now catching up with the time. Okay, good. But I'm just asking... If I rebroadcast another show that actually was saying buy this video or buy this tape. That's up to you. That's up to me. Yeah. Okay, I thought that would be... Okay. Okay, sir. Sorry to bother you again. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, we're on the air here. Yeah, you're on the air. We're in Lake Dallas, 89.7. Oh, okay. Where's Very good. 89.7. Yeah. Dallas, Texas. That is. Right. FM. So if FM. You, FM. FM stereo. Good. Excellent. Y'all have a good one. You too. Thanks for calling. All right. 
Very good. 89.7 in Dallas, Texas. So if you're listening on shortwave and you are in Dallas, Texas, tune in uh, FM 89.7 and you you can uh, listen to that station. I'm sure he has some other good programming also. Mm-hmm. 520-333-4578 is the number. Nobody's won the night yet. No. Can't guess what we had for supper tonight. Think they will? I don't know. No. If they don't, I'm not going to tell them. No. <laughs> if they do, we'll give them a night. There you For supper tonight? Yeah. What? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Want to take a guess? I just thought it was Haggis. Yeah, I guess. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Oh, oh that, was, uh, that was your guess. Okay. That was my guess, Haggis. Oh, I thought you were referring to somebody who did Celtic music. I didn't even catch, it, catch what you were saying. Yeah, right. Okay. No, 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 that's not what we had. Okay. Not at all. All right. But uh, sometimes I wish we had some scones and uh, mm-hmm. some of that good food. Yeah. What else can we do for you? Well, you know, I'm having trouble trying to figure out how to write my name. It sounds like a stupid question, but, um, you know, they, they want you to write it uh, with the caps, small letters and caps. And you, can you talk a lot louder, please? Yeah, yeah the, uh, the way that a fiction person is, it's all capital letters in their name. Yeah. And uh, the way you're name is supposed to be for a sovereign is just the first letter capitalized. Yes. And also some people say you should write, you know, your first name, middle name, comma, and then your last name. That's correct. You know why? Some people say you should hyphenate your between your first and second name. You, you can do that too, if okay. you wish. But do you know why? I'm not exactly sure wh- why. Um, your, your last name is not yours. Belongs to your family. Your name is your first name and your middle name. The last name is the family name. Belongs to the family collectively. Only your first name and middle name belie, uh, belong specifically to you. Okay. And it has to be spelled out. No abbreviation. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, you know, my birth certificate um, in 1949, evidently they made a mistake and they didn't put it in all caps. Then They put it uh, the right way. I haven't seen it. <laughs> have, have you seen yours? I have seen mine, yes. But, you know, it doesn't make any difference. If there is a birth certificate, you are owned by the state. You are a human resource. And they can pledge all of your work and productivity to back the national debt. That's why, in 1933, they instituted the Department of Human Resources 
and began the requirement that all babies born must have a birth certificate, which is then sent to the Department of Human Resources. Okay. But there's a way to get around all that, or get revoke all that, isn't there? Oh, there's a way to get around all of it. Yeah, it's all fraud, you see. You cannot be held to a contract, the terms of which were never explained to you. You did not enter into it willingly. Also, in a matter of a birth certificate, you are not a party of the contract because you did not sign it. You were not even of age to be responsible to enter into a contract. See, they scam people. They lie to us. They cheat us. They defraud us of our birthright. And it's all done by sneaky, underhanded lies. Because that's the kind of people they are. They are scum, puke faith, lying, manipulating cowards. Quite a shock to learn all this stuff. Sure it is. It was a shock to me. When I found out I'd been serving a system that was enslaving me for most of my life, I was incensed. Absolutely incensed. I was so angry you wouldn't even believe how angry I was. I jumped in a bottle of scotch for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Yes, it will, but you can do it. And as a last resort, if they absolutely refuse to let you out, you can do what I've done. You can say, my rights come from God, not from you. I refuse to bow to your tyranny. I refuse to pay your tribute. And if you come against me and mine, I will defend myself with what the Founding Fathers gave me as a last resort against tyranny and I'll die on my doorstep rather than to submit to you scum. Like Braveheart. You don't, you don't go out and kill them. No. You defend your creator endowed rights against them should they come to kill you or take your property. That's what we all must do. If every single person in this country would take that stand and take their stand with and for their neighbor, it would be all over. And we would have the restoration of Republican constitutional government. Yeah, if we all went, woke up, right. Unfortunately, most people are cowards. Yeah. Seems to be the state. Well, we've been dumbed down, too. <laughs> Dumbing down is no excuse for cowardice. No, that's true. Once you've received the truth, if you continue to live in the fantasy, that's cowardice. But that's up to you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for calling. 520-333-4578. We've got enough time for, I don't know, a couple more calls, whatever we want to do, I guess. In the next however many, whatever it is. Uh-huh. And it's... it's uh, oh, you wrote me a letter about all this. 
What's that? Aren't you the one that, did you write me a letter about some of this? No, actually, I called uh, either late last week or earlier this week. Oh, okay, that's what I'm thinking of. Go yeah, ahead. and I, I got to see both of them. I took some notes, and uh, it's weird that they, well, I guess it's not weird. They both uh, seem to talk about the same thing. Shimon Perez kept mentioning, uh, of course, he said democracy about 30 times. But he kept mentioning about what he was talking at a university, and he, he said he wanted to talk to the young people. That's one reason he came here. Um, he talked about getting that they need to get ready and uh, start changing their way of thinking about things. <coughs> of course, he mentioned glo globalization a whole lot. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what he believes in. Oh yes, and uh, I, uh, I made a copy of a page out of your book. And uh, I, I'm a teacher. I teach in a middle school. I, I'm, I'm trying to work my way up to teaching uh, political science high school. But anyway, I made a copy of your book. Of uh, you have a copy of, from a Look magazine, 1962, of David Ben Gurion. Yeah. His uh, view of the world in 1987. Uh huh. Now, uh, next to that, I put the biography that uh, they gave us at the lecture of uh, Shimon Peres, how he was handpicked in his 20s to be uh, the Minister of Defense of Israel by uh, David ben uh -huh. So, uh, I mean, I just see a connection there of uh, the, you know, one of the men who groomed him and, of course, his view of the world. And I guess if people don't have your book, uh, uh, ben Gurion's view of the world in 1962, looking ahead 25 years, was a, uh, well, he looked at the United States as having a, a planned economy, being a, wel a, wel a welfare state and a planned economy. And that the world, there would be a world system, and it would be ruled from Jerusalem. And they would build a a temple, no, a uh, I can't remember the wording, a a uh, shrine to the of the prophets. Yeah. And they would have an international court there to settle all disputes. And of course, there'd be a uh, international police force, and there would be no more armies and no more wars. Yeah, his was the uh, was the Zionist goal. The Zionist goal. Yes. Now, Lech Valesa Valens tonight, I can't mispronounce his name, uh, who, who doesn't speak any English, he had an interpreter. He's uh, a devout Catholic, and I believe he was <laughs> born and raised not far from where Pope John Paul is from. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mentioned, uh, well, of course, his, uh, he mentioned a lot about the Pope, or the, the Holy Father, as he called him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he mentioned how the Holy Father traveled to Poland when it was under communism and talked to the workers, and the, the Holy Father brought the truth. He said that several times to the interpreter. Now, remember, when remember... The Lech, truth from the Holy Father, that's when solidarity started. Yeah, but solidarity is a, con is a communist concept written about long before it ever appeared uh, anywhere there. Lech Walensa is a communist. Well, you can't be a you can't you can't be a communist and be a Catholic at the same time. Okay, okay. Communists do not believe in God or Jesus Christ or anything else. Well, right. But they, communism is atheism. But they do believe in world government, and so does the Pope. Right, that's so the, the key. Pope does. Now, um, what's funny is I have a, a book. Well, I mentioned it the other night about J. Edgar Hoover's study of communism, and I was sort of perusing it right before the lecture, and I got to the point where. Um, the, uh, Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto, one of the last slogans or lines is, uh, workers of the world unite. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's solidarity. That's solidarity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the notes of the lecture, it, the wording was almost exactly the same. Yeah. Now, now, let me tell you how these lectures work. Well, I'm sure you know. They, they filter the questions. They, they don't allow you to walk up to the microphone. They give you a card unless you write your question. Yeah, that's so that they can uh, make sure that they're not asked anything that might uh, be embarrassing or might uh, actually tip the hand of what's really going on there. Yeah, they never ask my questions. It's weird. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but Valesa said this because these were all such softball questions, you know, about, you know, how great uh, you were in solidarity. He said to the interpreter, now he has a very, he's, he's got a really good sense of humor, but uh, he said to the interpreter, uh, you know, what, what are you scared to ask me some hard questions? So the, uh, the college professor filtering the question there he even said, what is this, some kind of censorship? And so he read a hard question, and it was some, I don't know who it was, at the auditorium was tight, but they basically <laughs> said, well, um, your ideas of this globalism, you sound like a socialist. And, and that was the, basically the question. And Valencia went, went into this long spiel 
to basically talk about how evil communism was. And he basically, then in the last sentence, he said, I am not a socialist. But I tell you what, everything he said sounds like he's... Well, he is a socialist. He's yeah. also a communist. He's also a liar. Yes, that's what I was uh, trying to tell people. <laughs> and what's very interesting, there was a man who, who uh, made his way to the microphone now. And uh, I noticed on his arm a tattoo. And this man had white hair, and he looked uh, European. And he made his way to the microphone. And, of course, you know what that tattoo was. It was uh, about... It was a uh, five-digit number. I didn't see it. How could I know? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have the picture in my mind. But what I'm saying is uh, when you see an older man with white hair and he's got a five-digit number on his arm, I mean, you think of uh, a concentration camp survivor. That's, that's what I was trying to say. Could be, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. But he got up and he spoke Polish to, to uh, Valesa. Uh-huh. And then he spoke English, too, and the interpreter spoke. And he basically said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from a place not far from where you're from, and I have property there, but it was taken away from me. And then he mentioned, and I ended up in, uh, you know, started in Auschwitz and ended up in uh, Buchenwald, I believe you pronounce it. Uh, Buchenwald. Liberated. And he was a concentration camp survivor. Yeah. And he's been in America since 1945, and I talked to him right after the uh, lecture. And I heard him talk to somebody else, and what struck me was he was said, they asked him what he, they thought of the lesson. He says, uh, I don't see eye to eye with this man. He's talking about one thing, and he goes, what I, what I really am about is uh, um, what I've got from, from being here in America is freedom. And that's something he doesn't understand. That's right. And uh, so I had to talk to this man. He was very interesting. He's been here since the 40s. He got a sponsor uh, to send him over here to Texas, and he says uh, he was telling people about freedom. Yeah. And, Most people and, uh, who, he didn't go see uh, Shimon Perez because he doesn't see eye to eye with this man either. Yeah, you know, I've got to cut you off and get in the last comment here. Most people who immigrate to this country from other countries come here for freedom. And when they get here, they're absolutely amazed to find that most Americans are in the process of giving it up for what they left. Yeah. Good night, folks. Thanks, Bill. we got to, uh, we got to head on out of here because we're out of time. Thank you for calling. And... Uh, I don't know uh, who. I wasn't even thinking about this. So I think we can do this. We can do this one right here. Okay, folks. Good night. God bless each and every single one of you. Got another question for you folks. Just exactly who is Mike Mistrada? And what in the hell is he doing? And uh, for supper tonight, we had what, Doyle? Tempura vegetables. We had tempura vegetables and it was absolutely delicious. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> Included uh, green tomatoes, carrots, mushrooms, eggplant, broccoli, Everything good and wonderful. Oh, and man, was it delicious? Absolutely mouth-watering. I got so full, I almost couldn't do this broadcast. Hey, Doyle, you want this knife? We couldn't give it to anybody. I'll take it. Okay. It's yours. And good night, Randy Steele, wherever you are.
Whoever that was that just called, I didn't mean to hang up on you, was an accident. Call again. Could this be my